Thank you, Daryl. Good morning. If you are able, would you please stand and join me with, in the call to worship that's printed in our bulletin. In this sacred hour of worship, when we name things for what they really are, we give to God, bless God. Between the demands of this last week and the demands of the one ahead, we give to God, bless God. With open hearts and hands and minds, every innate gift from our loving Creator.
Let us pray. Faithful God, you are here. Tuck us into the cleft of the rock. Cover us with your hand when we are anxious that we may be courageous to do your will. Through Jesus, who calls us by name. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Let us now confess our sin, casting ourselves on the promised mercy and compassion of God. Let us pray. Our God, lover of justice, glories not in punishment, but in redemption. God has broken the power of sin and rescued us from shame. Be at peace. You are forgiven and you are free. And now let us take a moment 
to go to the Rock of Ages in prayer, in silent prayer. Lord, in the stories of your scripture, give us truth to cling to. Help us hear your still, small voice. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is from the book of Exodus. As, the, as Moses is leading the people through the wilderness, even Moses has called to ask God just what is going on. So let us listen to uh, Exodus 33, beginning at verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now if I have found favor in your sight, Show me your ways so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us. In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name the Lord and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy but he said you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live and the Lord continued see there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And then in our gospel lectionary from Matthew this week, Jesus finds himself in a trap. Now, it's could be the strange allegiance or um, alliance between the Pharisees and the Herodians, two groups that normally worked across purposes politically. Uh, that may be what had put Jesus uh, on alert. Yeah, then again, it could have been that heaped flattery that masked their opening salvo. Uh, Maybe it was his divine intuition. Well, in any case, Jesus is very aware that these latest conversation partners are not working in good faith. The Herodians and the Pharisees wanted Jesus to make the people angry. They wanted to paint him as a traitor or a criminal or both. But instead of anger... Jesus gave the people hope. Hope that while Caesar had much power and money and might and can do much real and painful harm, he is nothing compared to the power and mercy of God. Hope that the people of God might not divide themselves on how they answer trick questions. 
but see each other as bearers of the image of God. It's an invitation, even when politics has entered the room, to keep working in good faith. It's an invitation we can use today. So let us hear what God is saying to us today through these ancient words. This is from Matthew 22, beginning at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, the emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed and they left and went away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever had one of those days when you needed to be in two or three places at the same time? Okay, let me rephrase this. Have you ever had one of those days when you did not need to be in three places at the same time? You know, maybe if you remember back, maybe you got a meeting uh, to get ready for at work. You've got a sick child at home. And your best friend has just called up saying she really needs to talk and can you have lunch today? Well, you know, we've all been there really more often than we care to admit. We are committed to a lot of different people and a lot of different entities, family, friends, vocation, community, civic clubs, fraternal organizations, the church, not to mention taking care of ourselves. It's a juggling act. And when two or more demand our attention at the same time, we're torn. Well, that is the essence of stress, being pulled in two or more directions at the same time. You know, like a rubber band being stretched to its limits. And that's the topic of the sermon this morning the way in which competing forces lay claim to our time, talent, money, and energy. And what I hope you'll get out of it is this. When you place God at the center of your life and commit yourself first and foremost to doing God's will, everything else will kind of fall into place. It's a matter of putting God first. So let's begin with the text. Now on the surface, the gospel lesson seems to address a legitimate question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But now we all know that that's just a ruse. Those who are asking the question are not really seeking Jesus' counsel. They're trying to catch him off guard. Uh, Matthew writes, Then the Pharisees went and took counsel how they might entrap him in his talk. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. 
And as I said before, the Herodians and the Pharisees are odd bedfellows at best. The Herodians are pro-Rome. The Pharisees, anti-Rome. Uh, no matter how Jesus answers this question, he's going to offend one or the other. To side with the Herodians is to commit heresy in the eyes of the Pharisees because to pay tribute to Caesar was, in effect, to bow down to other gods. But to side with the Pharisees is uh, treason in the eyes of the Herodians because to refuse to pay tribute to Caesar was an act of sedition. So they flattered Jesus in an effort to entrap him. They said, teacher, we know that you're honest and teach the way of God in truth, no matter whom you teach, for you aren't partial to anyone. So tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Okay, well, if they thought they were going to pull the wool over Jesus' eyes, they had another thing coming. He turned the question back on them and said, why are you putting me to the test? Show me the coin that is used for the tax. So they handed him a coin, which was the equivalent of a day's wages. He looked at it and said, whose is this image and the inscription? And they said, it's Caesar's. And he said, therefore, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Matthew doesn't say whether he kept the coin or gave it back, does he? So give, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. Oh, man, if it were only that simple. In a sermon based on this text, uh, Charles Hafaker says, we are not called upon simply to give the emperor what belongs to the emperor. We are called upon as well to give to relatives, friends, strangers, co-workers, employees, and all other people, whatever it is of us, they can rightly claim. We are charged with the creative and challenging task of transforming our diverse and divided loyalties into a unified life governed and directed by our supreme and absolute loyalty, which is to God and God alone. Once we give ourselves absolutely to God, then remarkably, we are free to give to others in ways that are gracious and life-giving rather than distorted and destructive. No longer are these loyalties divided. Instead, we recognize how deep down they are in concord for each is an invitation from God. Okay, let's apply this to everyday life. In my relatively short time as a minister, I have been privileged to officiate a number of weddings, some of which were for family members. Now, I don't know if you know this, but before you do a wedding, you've got to do a certain amount of premarital counseling. And I have actually had a couple counsel their wedding uh, because of things that turned up in the premarital counseling. You know, I always ask the couple, well, what is your expectation of married life? Because I, I remind them, even if they're not big churchgoers, marriage is really three parties, the husband, the wife, and God. And a healthy marriage is one that weaves all three in perfect unity. But, I mean, let's be honest. We all know what happens in real time. You get busy and preoccupied with paying the bills and doing a good job at work and raising the kids and 
going out with friends and serving on committees and keeping up with your favorite team until you're lucky if you have any time left over for each other. Well, guess what gets left out? Your relationship with God. And it's God's grace and love and the peace and fellowship of God's spirit in the home that makes all the difference. So what I intend to say to the couple, what I'd like for you to hear this morning is simply this. Put God first. Cultivate and nourish your relationship with God and your relationship with your spouse, your children, your friends, and all others that you're committed to will fall into place, into their proper place. You'll find the time and the energy to do what needs to be done. Marva Dawn, um, who is an author we read a lot of in seminary, makes this point with regard to keeping the Sabbath holy. Now, first she states the obvious. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Well, duh. Then she elaborates on how hard it is to keep the Sabbath holy in this 24-7 dot-com world. Then she shares what she's learned out of her own experience. And that is when you set one day a week aside to worship and honor God, you're more productive with the other six. Now here's the way she puts it. In the earliest days of my effort to keep the Sabbath, I used Sundays to prepare a big pot of stew or soup to last all week so that I wouldn't have to cook while I was busy with my graduate studies. I soon learned, however, that such a practice was spoiling the value of the Sabbath because that activity itself was another attempt to secure my own future. Furthermore, the attitudes engendered while I was cooking were contrary to the purpose of the Sabbath, to free me from all work that I have to do to provide for myself. Strangely enough, I discovered that when I stopped making the week's pot of stew on Sunday, there was always extra time to do that on another day. Putting God first gives you the peace and poise not to be rattled by all the competing claims on your life for the rest of the day. Okay, then there's the question of money. It never seems to be enough to go around. In addition to paying bills, there are the things we'd like to have and the places we'd like to go and the things we'd like to see and do. Well, Here's the bottom line, whether it's paying taxes to Caesar or spending enough time with your loved ones or doing a good job at work or fulfilling all your various commitments in and around the community. There are lots of competing claims on your life. And some days, if not most, you probably wonder whether there'll be enough of you to go around. Well, the secret is to put God first. Make your relationship to God the first and most important part of each day. And God will give you the capacity to do all the rest. Once long ago, before I had ever started seminary, ever thought about starting seminary, um, I was at a Presbyterian women meeting and the person leading the devotion that particular evening happened to be the minister's wife. And she filled a vase with rice, you know, just regular old uncooked rice. Then she took three large walnuts and tried to squeeze them into that vase. Well, you can imagine, rice went everywhere. I've forgotten whose home we were at, but they probably were vacuuming up rice for the next month. You know, there just wasn't room in that vase for those three large walnuts. Well, 
She took the walnuts out. She poured the rice into a bowl. Then she put the walnuts in the vase down at the bottom. And it was a clear vase so we could see them. She poured the rice back into the vase. And guess what? There was plenty of room for all the rice and the walnuts. Not a single grain was spilled. Put God first and everything else will fall into place. This is what Jesus told his disciples so long ago. But seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, having heard the word of the Lord read and proclaimed, let us rise in body or in spirit as we're able and proclaim what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. may be seated. Let us pray. God, we know that you see everything that happens in this world. Nothing we pray about is news to you. Yet still we pray, asking that your peace and wisdom rest on us and your presence transform our lives. We pray for those across the world and in our communities who are scared today, those who face violence because of where they live or where they work or who you have created them to be, for those whose future seems dark, for those whose anxiety eats away at them and who cannot find peace. Spirit, living flame, Encourage them. We pray for those who hurt today, for the sick, the hungry, the abused, the grieving, the lonely. We pray for those who struggle with pain in body or mind or spirit. We pray for the compassionate who hurt because the world hurts. Jesus, healer, Comfort them. We pray for those who woke up angry today. We pray for those who feel excluded, overlooked, trapped. We pray for those who feel entitled, unappreciated, out of control. We pray that where anger leads to pain, you would bring peace. But that where anger, anger leads to justice, you would bring wisdom. Jesus, table turner, guide them. We pray for those who are full of hope today. We pray for those who are beginning new relationships or careers or working to get clean. We pray for those who see sprouts of your kingdom poking up through the cracks in the sidewalk. We pray for those who are a light in the darkness. Strengthen them, Holy Spirit. God, there is much we have forgotten to pray for today, yet we know that nothing escapes your notice. Direct our eyes this week, we pray, that we might come to know your heart more fully. We pray now as you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Scripture praises the work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. We give now, not for the flesh or the flame, fame, or, but in quiet, steadfast hope that every dollar we give might serve to build up the body of Christ in this congregation and the beloved community in the world. Their offerings matter. Make them with confidence.
Let us pray. Lord, we dedicate our all to you, not just the money that we no longer call ours, whether it is sitting in the plate or whizzing along digital paths, but our thoughts, our plans, our time, our dreams, our days. It's all yours, God. It always was. Help us to rejoice in that. Amen. And until we meet again, remember that wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there because God has a purpose in your being there. Christ, who dwells within you, has something he wants to do through you. And God has given you the Holy Spirit to guide you, equip you, and sustain you along the way. Believe it and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the peace and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.